good afternoon. Um, in the name of the Finnish Institute of International Affairs, I welcome everyone to this event with the title After Hedging, the implications of the Biden administration for EU strategic autonomy. My name is uh, Niklas Helvig, and I'm a research, uh, a leading researcher here at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. And today we are going to take to discuss EU strategic autonomy. Um, this is not an isolated uh, FIA event, an isolated seminar that we are doing, but um, this is part of a bigger research project we are currently doing at FIA um, on EU strategic autonomy. For example, yesterday and today we had a workshop with American and European researchers um, on this topic as we are preparing a uh, report which is going to be published later this spring on this issue of EU strategic autonomy. And um, some of these authors that are participating in the report are on the panel today, Tobias and Garrett. I'm going to introduce them later in detail. Um, but we wanted to have this opportunity also to have a larger discussion with a larger audience on the future of EU strategic autonomy and specifically what uh, this change in the White House that we saw yesterday means for this ambition of EU strategic autonomy. So I guess that most of, of, of you have some familiarity with the term strategic autonomy. It has been now uh, used very frequently in speeches by EU policymakers, in opinion pieces, articles across European um, and newspapers and online outlets, and um, it, it, it's often cited as is an ambition of the EU. But it is sometimes actually quite difficult to understand what, what is meant by EU strategic autonomy. And to everyone who's struggling with the terms, I, I can, I can uh, say, don't worry. We as researchers, we are also still trying to get uh, our head around it. But I think this is part of, of, of this uh, um, uh, process. This event is part of this process of of discussing what the EU wants to achieve in its in its external policies and what it means actually by this concept. So this concept started on defense already in the 90s with the foundation of the common security and defense policy. There was talk about um, EU's auto autonomous capabilities, about operational autonomy of the EU when it comes to military capabilities. But since then, the, pro, uh, the concept has broadened uh, significantly, significantly, and it's now also on technological interdependencies with other actors. It's about the economy, especially now during the COVID crisis. There was a lot of, on, uh, of questions regarding uh, autonomy, um, regarding health matters and, and, and important health goods. So it's it's not just about, as we see it, uh, on defense and military matters, but it's it's, it's a broader term. Um, and it's also has broadened regarding what are the actors vis-a-vis -vis the EU intends to be autonomous from. It, it, when we talked about the uh, defense and military aspect, it was often uh, mainly mainly defined in in relation towards the US as the military superpower uh, uh, internationally. But when we talk about economic and technological interdependencies, of course, China and the role of uh, China in the world becomes uh, more and more central. Mm, so, and we all know that the Trump administration, um, uh, under the Trump administration in, in the last years, um, strategic autonomy took on a matter of urgency maybe for the EU. Mm, there were, for example, the extraterritorial sanctions um, on Iran that forced European business into compliance with these US sanctions and made it difficult for the for the EU to follow the diplomatic goals vis-a-vis -vis the Iran. There were questions of, of the US undermining the international multilateral system when we think about the climate policies. So um, there the question of an autonomous EU came to the forefront, especially and was underlined. But today we meet one day after the inauguration of Biden. And he said yesterday in, in, this, in, in his inaugural address, uh, and I can quote here, we will repair our alliances and engage with the world once again. Not to meet yesterday's challenges, but today's and tomorrow's. 
We will lead not mere, merely by example of our power, but by the power of our example. Of course, you said it much nicer than, than me and without this heavy German accent, but you, you see the main message that uh, he, he's, uh, he's arguing uh, you at the US is back at the table. Mm. So today we want to discuss how this new approach of the Biden administration uh, impacts the EU ambition for strategic autonomy. Uh, first, of course, there's the question how this uh, new administration under Biden will see this EU ambition. Uh, then there's the question um, whether this more cooperative approach of the US means that the EU can just lean back and trust US global leadership, or are there maybe other factors that are driving the EU in this ambition to become more self-reliant? For example, uh, as mentioned er earlier, China. Um, so, so there are also other questions to discuss in, in policy fields like trade, like technology. And for that, I'm very grateful that we have such a good panel here today with experts on different dimensions of these policies, because it's really about policies that we talk in the end. I will introduce every speaker while I'm addressing, before I uh, give the first question to them. So uh, we start with with Gareth Martin, uh, he's a senior professional, uh, uh, sorry, senior profes professorial lecturer, lecturer, sorry, a senior professorial lecturer uh, at, and the co-director of the Transatlantic Policy Center at the American University. Uh, he has written widely on transatlantic relations and Europe and uh, has a, a background uh, as a historian, but also uh, has written a lot on, on contemporary affairs. And uh, the, the Transatlantic Policy Center is actually a, a fairly new uh, addition to the, to the think tank scene in, in DC and a very welcomed one. We, we cooperate closely together with them. They are great friends of us. And they, they received a pre prestigious uh, European Commission funding and they are uh, the only Jean Monnet Center in Washington, D.C., working on these transatlantic issues. Um, so, so it's really a big achievement uh, what you are doing there, Garrett. So um, my first question to you, like we saw yesterday uh, that a very different U.S. president is, is taking office. And of course, he's facing many challenges uh, when you think about COVID, when you think about the internal divisions. So he's probably not waking up in the morning thinking about the EU, nor thinking about concepts like strategic autonomy. But uh, uh, still, uh, he, he, he announced also that, that international issues are uh, one of the priority areas for him. So how do you expect the Biden administration will approach the EU? Uh, will it support this idea of strategic autonomy or be more worried about decoupling? Well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas, for the kind words. It, it's, it's a pleasure uh, being part of this event this morning and to be on this panel with some distinguished colleagues. Uh, I very much do regret, maybe uh, selfishly, that we're not able to meet in person because it would have been a delightful to be back in Helsinki, which I haven't been in many years. Uh, yeah, so, you know, it, it's the morning after the inauguration. So, uh, you know, I want to make a couple of points. I mean, I think the obvious welcome change, I think, for many in Europe is that we're going to see an immediate change in style and in atmosphere. You know, no more insults via tweets, no more calling the EU a foe. That in itself, I think, should not be under, understated. That is important. Uh, you know, there's the old saying that personnel is policy. Certainly, if we look at the people that Joe Biden has surrounded himself, especially people who will focus on Europe, he has picked very experienced diplomats, practitioners with real expertise and attachment to Europe. Of course, I'm thinking about Anthony Blinken, uh, Secretary of State, his National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, uh, Senior Director at the NSC, Amanda Sloat, you know, just to give a few examples. And we've also seen already some early actions that, that I think are meant to symbolize and in line with that line you quoted about repairing alliances. We've seen some executive orders yesterday, such as rejoining the Paris Accords, rejoining the WHO. These, I think, are all part of the charm offensive that we should be seeing in those first few days. Uh, so that's, I think, the good news. 
Now, what gives me a bit more pause here is the quote you gave, Nicholas, was essentially practically the only lines about foreign policy in the inaugural address yesterday. Uh, you have to go back to FDR's first, in, you know, again, that's a historian in me. You have to go back to the 1933 FDR inaugural to have as little about foreign policy in an inaugural address. FDR had one line, you know, Biden had two or three. But again, it speaks volumes to his priorities, what he's going to focus on. It speaks volumes, I think, to the question of bandwidth. How much space is Joe Biden going to have to focus on foreign policy in general and specifically in Europe? The one line that you didn't mention, though, Nicholas, there was only one other line that I noticed and which I think is important. He says, I'm quoting here, uh, we can make America once again the leading force for good in the world. And so for me, that suggests that certainly there would be continuity with the idea of American exceptionalism and American primacy. Okay. So I think that's something important here. Uh, there, there's going to be the question of bandwidth when it comes to foreign policy and transatlantic relations. I think the, the other elements too, which I think are not clear, but which will matter greatly, is I have no doubt that Joe Biden and the people around him are sincere in wanting to repair the alliance. That is, you know, I, I take them at their word and there's no reason to doubt that. The question is, how much of a priority will Europe be vis-a-vis -vis other big issues? And of course, the big one, the big elephant in the room is China. You know, will China become the overwhelming focus of a Biden administration and therefore relations with Europe will be viewed largely sort of a derivative. They will be sort of a, you know, viewed through the prism of the competition with China. And that I think has huge implications for Europe and for strategic autonomy. Okay. So that's something which I think, you know, we can't answer yet, but that's going to be an important way to, to help us think about this, this question. The other element, if you've paid attention to the speech yesterday, I, I believe the word unity was said quite a few times. So the imperative of trying to restore domestic unity, to restore domestic co cohesion. Uh, also, people around Joe Biden, like Jake Sullivan, have spoken about this idea of a foreign policy that serves the American middle class. And so any casual observer of the often sort of uh, pugilistic politics in Washington has probably noticed that there's not a huge degree of consensus when it comes to foreign policy between Republicans and Democrats. But the rare areas where there is consensus tends to be on issues like China, competition with China. So again, if I'm sort of thinking here of Biden's goal of trying to restore domestic unity, you can assume that he is going to privilege areas where he can view some positive ramifications in terms of his domestic agenda as well. And so I am not sure the degree to which improvement of relations with Europe beyond the sort of surface being nice and more polite is going to gain him a lot of po political benefits at home. So that's pause for concern for me here. Um, and I think I would add Additionally here, when you're talking now more specifically about strategic autonomy, I think it bears reminding that, you know, of course, under the Trump administration, as in many other areas, the reaction was generally combative, very negative towards strategic autonomy, especially towards issues like EDF and PESCO. Okay. It was viewed by the Trump administration as European protectionism, especially on that when it came to procurement. Uh, but it bears reminding that, you know, even under sort of Obama and under other administrations before that, there was at least ambivalence or not a great degree of enthusiasm for common European defense initiatives in Washington. And you're dealing with the same, a lot of the same personnel from the Obama years here. So that also suggests to me that I don't think we should be overly enthusiastic about the degree to which a Biden administration will embrace European strategic autonomy. Uh, you know, I, we have working with one of your colleagues, Vila Sinkonen, on, on a briefing paper that looks more specifically at this idea. And, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview here, but we were thinking about three different models for us to think about how a Biden administration might approach Europe. I mean, these are broad, simplest 
sim uh, simplifying models. But you know, one could be an assumption of neglect towards Europe with an overwhelming focus on China. The second model would be more of a traditional return to primacy and basically trying to get American leadership back and expect European alignment. And a third model would be much more, far bolder in really Biden and the administration embracing uh, strategic autonomy, moving away from those unspoken contradictions that the United States wants Europe to do more, but generally wants to do more on its terms. Uh, I would say the last option from my perspective as a European of European descent would be the most desirable, but probably the least feasible. I think the default will probably be a return to sort of traditional primacy in terms of how the American administration approaches Europe. And I don't think that's going to be necessarily welcomed uh, in Europe. Uh, some of the recent polls, like from the European you know, Council on Foreign Relations, show really a deep degree of mistrust in American politics. And the one element that Biden cannot do, and which I think is vital, is Biden cannot guarantee to European partners that any major initiative that are done in the next four years or eight years will outlive him. And that is a profound question. The wild oscillation of American politics gives a lot of pause for people, uh, for allies and rivals across the world. So anyway, opening thoughts. Sorry, it's a little bit stream of consciousness, but uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty here, uh, I think, in the next few months. Oh, thank you very much for these opening thoughts. I think they were very illuminating. I think they point towards a not so distant future, towards a couple of following years where we're going to see maybe a little bit of friction actually between the US and the EU. When on the one side from the US, uh, there is this maybe possibly this expectation of, 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 of primacy, uh, so kind of returning to the, to the old model. While I think this vision of strategic autonomy on the EU side um, has been also very much set on track in a certain way, and it is also difficult to get out of the EU aspiration. So how they are going to handle this friction, you know, when it comes to concrete cases like Nord Stream 2, you know, where the US is imposed, but uh, the EU maybe wants to follow a different approach. Uh, on, on um, other issues like China. So that will be interesting. And that's um, also what I'm going to discuss now uh, with uh, Alice Panier, uh, who works uh, at IFRI, where she is the head of the Geopolitics of Technology program. Uh, IFRI is the French Institute of International Affairs in Paris. Uh, we met when we were a while ago, when we were both at uh, Size Johns Hopkins in Washington, D.C., I was I was just a humble visitor there while she was actually a real professor at Size uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and uh, yeah, as said, now she is the uh, head of the technology, uh, geopolitics of technology program in uh, at IFRI. So often strategic autonomy is perceived as a, as a French project. Uh, and, and lately this was underlined a little bit when Macron gave, uh, gave this interview in Le Grand Continent, which spurred a, a lot of discussion. And it actually emerged out of that, that there are still some different views within the EU on this ambition of strategic autonomy. There was this uh, famous um, op-ed from Annegret kram karrenbauer the German defense minister, answering to, to Macron. Uh, and there were also some central Eastern European voices also being critical about this idea of strategic autonomy. Um, and now we have this more cooperative Biden administration uh, in office. So do you think um, now that, that there's this change in the transatlantic relationship that the ambition for strategic autonomy will maybe evaporate and not be, be so much in the forefront anymore in the EU discussion? Um, thank you so much, uh, Niklas, for the invitation. Uh, it's good to see you again. It's, uh, it's good to be here, albeit uh, virtually. Um, I think, I mean, I, I can't read into the future, but um, I think one question that we should start by asking ourselves, and that question actually came to my mind when listening to, to Garrett, is to what extent, uh, you know, Europe's goal of strategic autonomy, and I say Europe as whether it's French or German or whatever, the goal of strategic autonomy, to what extent does it depend on the US and to what extent does it depend on Europe? 
you know, when it comes to the US, to what extent uh, the Europeans are pushed to be more strategically autonomous by a president like Trump, or to what extent are they authorized to be more strategically autonomous by a president maybe like Biden? Uh, to what extent do they need this blessing or this push? Or to what extent is it about Europeans just simply pursuing their own goals and having goals that lead them to make political decisions that uh, that are about pursuing their own interests, pursuing their own way out of uh, out of, you know, um, not necessarily divergent, but just separate interests. Like, for example, if we if we talk economic interests, uh, which is Tobias's um, topic, you know, by definition, these are two different economic areas, so they can have uh, similar but different, if you like, interests. So I think from the traditional perspective of strategic autonomy, which is the the, the defense perspective on the on the subject, uh, that is to say, we need a European Union that is able to conduct its own military operations, and that should rely on an ability to make autonomous decisions and to use their own capabilities, and that may require even their own uh, defense industry. There is a debate as to as how far in the down the line do you need to go to to be autonomous. But there was an autonomy of decision and action in the military space. Um, there is indeed a fear that on the French side that this military goal, if you like, of uh, this military ambition of strategic autonomy will slightly dissolve with Biden. Uh, because it's likely that there, was, there will be less pressure on the 2% uh, military spending. Um, it's it's likely to remain, you know, a goal at the NATO level, but there's going to be less pressure because, uh, you know, there, Biden will need to relieve some of the pressure that was put on the on the allies for political reason, I would I would assume, and also because we have weaker economies with COVID, that means that there's going to be less fewer absolute money available, but actually it may be easier to reach the two percent goal, uh, surprisingly enough. So, so the 2%, the military spending question will be less prominent also because as, as, as you know, we're discussing in the context of the pandemic, in the context of the rise of China, and in the context of, uh, you know, this technological um, competition that, that we see, uh, you know, taking uh, an increasing uh, increasingly big uh, space in the in in the public debate and in public policy spheres, the the military dimension right now is going to be that's my bet in the coming couple of years less prominent in the conversation unless there is a new you know military surprise around Europe obviously which could still happen. Um, so what we see, however, uh, despite this uh, sort of there is a fear of this military dimension of the debate uh, probably losing prominence and so the defense weakness of Europe not being solved. But what we do see uh, in parallel is we see an evolution of this strategic autonomy debate, as you were suggesting, uh, Nicolas, towards something that covers a much broader uh, range of policy areas, you know, and, and, and we can talk obviously of, uh, you know, critical infrastructures, external dependencies in, in, in critical um, areas, technology, etc. And we hear more and more about sovereignty rather than a strategic autonomy. I think um, even the French and Indian Macron in his, uh, in his lengthy uh, Grand Continent interview used the phrase uh, sovereignty and what he did is he often uses sovereignty, coma, strategic autonomy or the opposite that he kind of tries and, and, and use one instead of the other or add the two together as part of a, a bundle if you like. Um, I think one of the reasons is that um, the French understand that the strategic autonomy concept is divisive, obviously. There's been so many debates in the past four years, even though the concept is in the European global strategy, you know, Europeans have not come to an agreement after four years. And, and when I was in DC and you were there as well, you know, so many conversations were just about oh, debating the very concept of strategic autonomy, even among Europeans fighting each other in DC in front of their American uh, counterparts. So, so there is obviously an understanding in France now that this concept is far too divisive. Uh, there is also an understanding, and we've seen we're seeing this in the Sahel right now, is that um, the you know there is only so much you can do with military in the first place. And you know, even having your military means available, there's no panacea. It doesn't mean that you're going to be able to solve your security problems. So you cannot necessarily have this as your only political goal you know it can't be just an end in itself it does doesn't solve all the problems to be strategically autonomous and even obviously in the sahel france is not fully autonomous but it's the you know the a good example of a good degree of autonomy still but not so satisfying on the ground so um 
I think this this rise of the notion of sovereignty uh, will continue for a while, it, and it is going to have a, a little bit of an impact on policy making. I think at the European level, I think sovereignty is potentially less divisive because it's partly inward looking. And so people want sovereignty, and we have obviously some nationalist parties uh, uh, in our countries in Europe. Uh, uh, in the obviously the US has had its own episode, and it's not over. The UK as well. And so people, so to speak, want sovereignty. And I'm saying this with, with you know with uh, quotation marks, because then you can put whatever you want in people and in sovereignty. But I think we need to keep in mind that there are, for example, elections coming up in France in 2022 that the last election opposed the globalist Macron to the sovereignist Marine Le Pen. And if you present Europe as a source of sovereignty, as a Europe that protects, if you present European sovereignty as a solution to, to French problems and to global problems, I think that can be also a political goal, not only for France, but for other countries as well, if they manage to sort of associate this notion of European sovereignty with domestic political um, issues. So it's likely to gain some public opinion support more than the military dimension, I think. Um, externally, also, sovereignty is not uh, designed at anyone. All the countries around the world are sovereign and doesn't mean that they can't be allies, doesn't, you know, they can, you know, they can choose to, to, to come together. So, so I think uh, it, it's more neutral in a way, externally. But obviously some, some new problems comes with it, and I'm just going to close this, these initial remarks with this point, is externally the US, and, and you mentioned that already, the US, uh, or it was Garrett, that the US see uh, this notion of, of uh, sovereignty, just like um, strategic autonomy, as an excuse for protectionism, as an excuse for defending European companies against American ones. Uh, so it, so it, 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 it also comes with some uh, uh, external pushback. Uh, and internally, we have this strange situation, similar to the strategic autonomy debate, I think, where we have an EU commission and an EU uh, external action service that are very pushy, with ideas of sovereignty and strategic autonomy, even though that doesn't necessarily reflect the viewpoint of all of the member states. And so we have this weird disconnect where, where France and, and, and Brussels and in some way Germany are pushing some policies that other Euro European countries are like, actually, this is not necessarily what we've signed up for. And so this problem of disconnect and, and, and dissonance will have to be, to be uh, somehow dealt with. I'll stop here for now. Thank you, Alice, for, for illuminating us on, on this internal EU discussion, which is indeed, as you said, uh, very, very complex and driven by different actors. And it's good that you mentioned also the Commission as one of the actors uh, that pushes this idea of strategic autonomy. And that brings us directly to our next speaker, because when it comes to the area of trade, um, uh, the, the EU is, is, is working on this concept of open strategic autonomy. And that is where I want to put my next question to uh, Tobias Gerke. He is a research fellow in the Europe in the World program at the Egmont Institute in Brussels, and he focuses on geoeconomics, economic security strategies, and the securitization of economic and technological interdependencies. So really on this on this interplay of economics and politics, uh, that's where his research is focusing on. So, so this this idea of the the Commission pushing now uh, the strategic autonomy concept um, is is quite interesting. And 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 there is um, uh, a communication by the European Commission coming up in the next couple of months this spring on open strategic autonomy and what kind of changes this might bring actually to to the EU trade policy. So, so I wanted to ask you, Tobias, uh, uh, whether what what these changes are, and whether you anticipate major, um, yeah, major changes uh, to to how the EU is 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 viewing its trade policies and industrial policies. Yeah, thanks, Nicholas, and um, yeah, also thank you from my side. I just want to throw in in the beginning, you know, after watching yesterday's inauguration, and especially the young poet um, Amanda uh, Gorman. Um, who had this great poem. I think, you know, someone should maybe have a, instead of a webinar, maybe we should have a poetry slam about strategic autonomy, because really that, I think, can really um, capture the hearts and minds maybe better of our audience than, than our discussion. I don't have a poem, unfortunately. Also, open strategic autonomy doesn't really uh, lend itself to poetry, poetry does it? Um, uh, but this open strategic autonomy, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit of a misnomer because openness and autonomy I'm not sure that that really works. 
I think it really just signifies a, a pushback that came from the commission mostly, particularly DG Trade and DG Competition, who were opposed, I think, to this to this burgeoning notion of autonomy. And if they would be able to, you know, set the the, the terms uh, a new term, I don't think they would choose strategic autonomy. But at that time, early last year, this term was so much on vogue that they sort of had to roll with it and and uh, and had to do something else with it and said, well, let's use it, uh, let's say open, because in the sense, I think they argue, there is no viable nor desirable path to actual autonomy, right? Uh, and I think they're right about it. That doesn't mean we have to manage risks and we have to manage the risks and opportunities in a, in a, in a new environment in a global economy, but uh, it's a bit of a fighting back against this notion of, of autonomy. And um, so I think open strategic autonomy is, you know, a, first of all, a stock taking exercise. It's mostly saying, well, OK, what kind of risks are there? Is Europe facing in the in the global economy today? And that discussion has definitely uh, broadened from obviously the economic issues. Uh, you know, WTO isn't working properly. There's really all these new trade issues from digital to environmental. And then there's all these other trade level playing field issues, they call them subsidies, state owned enterprise and so on. That's pretty economic, big economic challenges. But there's also much more of an understanding, I think, in Europe today than two years ago, that there's also these strategic and these actual security risks. Obviously, everyone saw that uh, that we had supply chain uh, supply issues during COVID-19. But there's also a growing understanding of this weaponization of the economy in, 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 in Beijing and in and, and Washington uh, particularly. And more of an understanding of, of of the risks that come from particular economic transactions, like investments, like infrastructure, or or technology transfers. Um, and so, you know, the question is then, of course, how do you go about addressing these risks? And there's definitely more disagreement, I would say. Uh, last week, Sabine Rayand, uh, DG uh, Director General of DG Trade, uh, I think she said it quite nicely. She said, "Open strategic autonomy means that we act together with others." multilaterally or bilaterally, wherever we can, and we act autonomously wherever we must. Now, in the last two years, it, be, it seemed like we had we had to act a lot autonomously because the whole policy focus, uh, I would say, was really on these autonomous actions or defensive actions. There's a lot of going on. I, I'm not going to go into details, but there were policies that tried to you know, defend the single market against these unfair trading practices, to try to defend against economic coercion, what is weaponization of, of trade. And there were those policies that tried to more defend the security or the uh, national security in, in a more traditional sense, critical infrastructure or, or supply of critical goods, etc. But um, going forward, um, you know, what, what policies are to come on this and uh, what, what are the prospects for transatlantic cooperation? I'd say, um, you know, I... I would say that you know, these defensive policies are not mutually exclusive to a more cooperative approach. I think all great powers, in fact, acknowledge that there's a need for a multidimensional strategy. You have to work at home and you have to work abroad. And even though a lot of the focus of open strategic autonomy, if you will, and trade was quite defensive in the past, there's still the EU is still very much engaged in, in WTO reform, even though it's not working so well, maybe. But there's also this bilateral offer that the European Commission has put out in December uh, for America, the Transatlantic Trade and Tech Council, for example, and there's other initiatives like connectivity. I think they will be big where there's also lots of potential for cooperation with the Americans and, and other partners. But um, uh, and, and my concluding note would be, you know, does that mean we're going to go into some sort of economic cooperation honeymoon and I'm afraid not, because, you know, even though, as Garrett said, it's, it looks pretty good right now, the mood is pretty good, but this, uh, the tra trade uh, conflict is really, there's still serious disagreement and, and, and irritants in the transatlantic trade agenda. Um, first of all, there's still the threat of tariffs uh, uh, looming in a way. There's also actual tariffs on, on this airborne Boeing uh, is, uh, case. There's really disagreement of, OK, we want to reform the WTO, but not even the Europeans and the Americans have come to a agreement. I mean, let alone anyone else, uh, the Chinese or so on. There's huge issues about digital trade, about data flows, about competition policy, state aid policy. These all feed into uh, the trade uh, uh, agenda. And and uh, EU has is embarking on a major agenda also in green policies to implement the Green Deal. 
which will also go through trade policy. There's the potential of a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is essentially saying, well, we might have to put on some tariffs into uh, European imports. There's huge potential for conflict, in other words. Um, and many of these issues in America, but also in Europe, I think are really trade fundamentals. They're really close to national interests. So in other words, I don't think we can just parse them over with a new president uh, in America or uh, somewhere in Europe. Um, we are still competitors and uh, we are competing for rules and for market access and this sort of rosy um, uh, language that we have to cooperate on China is good and that might be something where, uh, that brings us closer together but at, at heart we're really competing. And so my issue is more that this is maybe that we that we should be careful not to oversell it, what's possible, um, um, because maybe, you know, given all these irritants and these disagreements in the, you know, in the first year now, the best outcome for Europe maybe would probably be if there's some sort of trade truce, you know, if we don't go into further conflict. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the mood. There's a lot of uh, optimism now, but I think... Uh, uh, we have to be careful not to oversell it. Thank you so much, Tobias, for, for this for these opening remarks. And uh, it seems there's a common theme from so far from the contribution that, that stresses a lot the continuity despite the change in the White House when it comes to the structural elements of, of, of this relationship that, that continue to to be present and, and also the internal constraints that both the EU, but especially also the US are facing. Um, I now want to turn to, to Hanna Oyanen. Uh, she's a senior research fellow at Tampere University, and she has widely published uh, on, on many issues concerning European foreign, European foreign security and defense policy. Uh, she's really one of the one of the experts when it comes to EU's global role and also the defense and security dimension of it and has also focused on interorganizational relations so relations between the EU and NATO for example so um Hannah um uh, I would like to ask you so you know you, having having done so much work on the EU already and having seen so many debates on EU's foreign policy in the past I mean we can also think about the whole debate that was there on the transatlantic relationship uh, during the time of the Iraq war. Um, how, how, how do you see the current debate? Is that, is that really a fundamental shift in EU foreign policy that we are seeing right now? Or, um, and, and if so, uh, what is different than before that, that um, the EU is, is pushing for the strategic autonomy? I think um, one of the elements of continuity that we already saw in the discussion is that we really cannot escape discussing concepts, can we? It, it, we always come back to definitions and uh, what these different concepts mean. Um, but I also, I do see something of a change. And uh, I think when we look at uh, partnerships, in foreign and security policy, above all. Um, we could see a, a sort of longer term change that we could sort of characterize as from uh, a, a change from nice to have to need to have. A kind of a need for a more serious look at what partnerships are. Um, I try to elaborate on that somehow. Uh, now, Partnerships, of course, are by no means new for the EU. The EU is an actor for which partnerships are really essential. It encourages cooperation in all forms. It has um, a multitude of different sort of degrees of cooperation and deeper cooperation. So partnership is not new and strategic partnership is not new either. But having the word strategic somewhere doesn't mean it is about something strategic. Strategic is just often a nice word. And so I think that oftentimes when there has been uh, the notion of strategic partnership in use, it has been more a, a way of telling to someone that 
that someone is really particular, it is special, and therefore the EU wants to give more uh, weight to the relationship, calling it strategic. So much more a compliment than anything uh, more uh, into it. Um, now, however, I think that what is new is the uh, combination of partnerships with autonomy. And this here, the EU needs to consolidate its thinking a bit more. Um, now, of course, the EU cannot exist if it's not autonomous, this we, we need to say. It needs to be recognized as an autonomous actor from its member states and from other actors. Um, but the new thing with strategic autonomy is, I believe, uh, that the EU needs to assess partnerships from the point of view of dependencies, um, the pros and cons of dependencies. <clears throat> and um, I think in the current international setting where we see much more great power competition and rivalry, um, the EU needs first to sharpen a bit its own goals and setting its own goals to be able to analyze these dependencies where the EU depends on others, how that matters in practice, um, so that you can choose dependencies rather than having to accept dependencies. Um, I'd add two further interesting dimensions to this. Um, first, the fact that um, member states themselves are different uh, from one another as when it comes to their dependencies on external actors. So the overall goal of reducing the EU dependency needs somehow to include evening out such differences between the member states or taking into account the differences to start with. And this is complicated. Uh, this is perhaps one of the reasons why uh, the common foreign and security policy has not been about relations with great powers, but relations with great powers have been more on the national side of foreign policy making because of these different dependencies. Um, the second uh, dimension that I, I'd add here is that um, there is increasing clarity that autonomy also extends to security and defense. Um, and that the EU is an actor that has a role even in, let's say, territorial defense, very traditional, little by little. So um, the strategic assessment of dependencies is ongoing even here. It perhaps takes other forms or other terms are used. The detection of analysis of gaps and shortfalls, perhaps it's another way of speaking about dependence. So we do have a kind of a different discussion. And if we add to this finally, the increasing need that the EU actually has for partnerships, be they partnerships or strategic partnerships or something still new, um, if we see need in these, all these newer fields, uh, fight against climate change, uh, defense of democracy, uh, health governance, defense of multilateralism. So actually, actually we, we need um, much more understanding of strategic partnerships and uh, the EU has quite a field to cover in its upcoming strategic reviews, I think. Thank you so much, Hannah. Yeah, also reminding of us of uh, this older concept of strategic partnerships that was uh, quite strong in the European security strategy uh, from 2003, right? And was always, um, yeah, was always criticized for for being a little bit hollow uh, and not not really clarifying what was so strategic about all these partnerships and was applying this label to to a lot of uh, in other international actors without having maybe clear priorities behind it and a, and a clear agenda. And then I also think your, your point on, on, on these asymmetric dependencies that 
uh, EU member states are facing is, is quite relevant and where you where you maybe see that some member states um, 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 perceive a, a greater dependency, for example, uh, on China than than others do, and uh, which 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 leads to some some in, in, incoherences also in the EU approach towards China, but also to other foreign foreign policy issues. Um, so at this point, I want to remind everyone um, that uh, if you have questions, you can already start um, um, putting them into uh, the the chat. Um, please feel free to. To, to ask anything on 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 these uh, aspects that we discussed, or if there's anything uh, we we haven't touched upon so far, but which you would find interesting, uh, of course that 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 can be uh, uh, put in there as well. Uh, yeah, so if you could use the the, the chat function for that, that 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 would be helpful. I, I think now I, I return um, once more to Garrett, and um, I found it quite interesting that that Ali said that. Maybe this this uh, discussion that was very prominent in recent years on burden sharing and on EU defense spending might go a little bit into the background or, or because of several reasons, because maybe the 2% goal, at least on paper, might be closer than before. Also because um, uh, other issues uh, than, than military um, and defense aspects might become more to the forefront. Uh, I'm curious how, how you see that and how you see uh, the, the Biden administration looking at, at this change. Are there a continued push uh, European states to, to, do, to, to spend more on their defense? Are they going to continue maybe with this leadership of, uh, from behind policy that, that Obama um, um, was pursuing, for example, in the Libya conflict where he was very hesitant to, to get involved and then uh, only only had a limited contribution there. Uh, yeah, what what are your your views on this? Well, you know, one should only hope. And again, I, I've been on record saying that I think the two percent is in uh, is an absurd and idiotic metric. I wish it would disappear in the ether. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I think you know to look at more broadly the question of uh, of the Biden administration and, and NATO. I think that you know there's a couple I think of, of, of important points here. Uh, one is, of course, you know that NATO does have you know had tumultuous years under Trump, and I think we all witnessed that. We all witnessed uh, the Trump questioning NATO, uh, questioning Article Five, and so forth. But I would also say that I think we need to mitigate a little bit our perception of the last four years. There was always two storylines. There was kind of Trump bull in the China shop uh, coming to the summits, making a real sort of display for a domestic audience that, you know, we're going to get allies to spend more. But I would also say, at least on the operational side, we have seen a lot of very positive developments in the last four or five years. And I think in particular, I would emphasize progress in terms of improving military readiness. Uh, discussions about military mobility, reforming the command structure. Uh, those may not get the headlines, but they've been important developments. Uh, placing the, you know, the issue of China on the NATO agenda. I mean, it's remarkable that the first time it happened was the December 2019 summit, it seems, years ago. Uh, so I think all of those important trends on the military operational side are there to stay. And I really don't see the Biden administration changing that. The question, however, is on the political side. You know, we had a very interesting, I don't know if people have had a chance to read it, but if you if you haven't, I would warmly encourage you to do so. But it was an expert uh, report that came out a few months ago with a lot of emphasis precisely on the political side of, of the alliance, how to improve consultation, how to improve cohesion, how to address issues such as democratic backsliding. Of course, there are a number of member states in NATO whose commitment to democracy seems rather flimsy these days. Um, you know, how to pivot NATO to deal with the rising presence of China. I mean, you know, Neil Stoltenberg talked about China is in Europe already. You know, it's a factor in Europe as we speak. So what does that mean for the alliance? And the question also of the expert group was it's time for a new NATO strategic concept. Okay. 
So I think the, the interesting question there, and I think this is a broader metaphor for the Biden administration, is how much of its political capital will it invest in this important exercise of NATO trying to rethink its core task and its role in the future? To what degree will it accept the advice of making the NAC, the North Atlantic Council, a really meaningful uh, place forum for political consultation? Okay. And, that, and I think that's really it's an important metaphor for a lot of what we've talked today in terms of the degree of consultation, the degree of sincere partnership between the United States and the Europeans. And of course, one old subject that many of us have talked about, uh, many of us have hoped for, but hasn't really materialized, are NATO and the EU going to be able also to move towards a more concrete, sustained, significant partnership? We've seen improvements at the operational level in the last few years, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. So, you know, that's something I don't have a clear answer. I'm sorry, it's more questions than answers here. But unfortunately, at least on the very on the burden sharing factor, I would be shocked if we had the Biden administration suddenly saying to hell with the 2%. It's a stupid, arbitrary, and un unhelpful metric. Let's really focus on a better way of thinking about alliance, alliance contribution. It might be more subtle than the Trump administration, but I don't think we're going to see a major change there, unfortunately. Right. Yeah, it's it's very, very interesting to hear thoughts about how, how maybe the Biden administration wants to or intends to revive a little bit the political dimension of NATO and the strategic thinking of NATO. And 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 and, and so uh, with the risk of, of putting our lease now a bit uh, at the at the spot, but uh, I think I, I, it would be interesting now to, to pass the ball back to Paris, kind of. And uh, this reminded me uh, uh, on, on Macron's famous um, uh, quote from last year that NATO would be brain dead, right? And that they're exactly this kind of strategic political thinking um, would not be present anymore. So brain dead was maybe, you know, a very harsh way to put it. So, But maybe NATO was only asleep, kind of, and dreaming and not focusing on this strategic element. So are you what what do you think would be would be the french french position on 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 the push by a biden administration to think more about nato's role in in this european security context or even wider than that and um especially uh with regards to to the fact that when it comes to the german position on eu strategic autonomy they often see it as well we can as we, we should think about it as European strategic autonomy and especially um, support the European pillar of NATO and think about strategic autonomy in the, within the NATO context. So, uh, yeah, what, what, is, what is your reaction uh, to, to, to this? Do you think um, there might be actually um, a conversion on, on NATO um, reform between France and Germany under these administrations? Um, well, I think w when the French president used the phrase brain dead, he was referring to an absence of coordination inside NATO, just like Garrett mentioned, the political dimension of the alliance. And it was he was referring to two specific examples. One was uh, Turkey's actions in northern Syria. And the other one was um, um, President Trump's behavior at the summits. <coughs> or at the summits. So, um, so I think that there is um, there is ambition that the alliance would uh, return or at least uh, um, uh, play its initial role fully, which was one of coordinating. Uh, political, uh, if you like, political, strategic, and defense positions of the members of the alliance. Uh, so I think, from that perspective, uh, you know, I, I don't think that uh, that they would disagree with with Biden at all. Similarly, on the two percent, uh, we may debate the figure if it's appropriate or not. But um, but France uh, has been consistently pushing for that goal to be fulfilled and to. At least uh, that's a just justification to reinforce the European pillar within NATO as well. I think where there might be disagreement, and that links to the the point that Garrett was making earlier. I think 
uh, is about the question of China indeed within NATO and to what extent uh, NATO becomes all about China. Uh, as this is indeed, I agree with Garrett, probably going to be one element of consistency to a large extent between the Trump and the Biden administrations where um, the risk for Europe is that it will become the main uh, condition of the transatlantic relationship that is going to be the, qu the China question, whether it's about trade, whether it's about um, uh, uh, just, um, um, you know, any degree of any, deg any element, uh, whether it's about the military dimension, whether it's about um, all the emerging domains that that we can we can talk about as well the, the technological um race if you like so so that's a point i wanted to make to make as well uh, a bit later i think that uh where there is going to be disagreement is indeed that that the french view nato in a more conservative uh fashion um as as the territorial defense and interoperability organization basically um i'll stop here for now yeah i know we have a little time left so yeah, no, interesting, interesting point. Yeah, so uh, 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 yeah, we have we have still 50 minutes left, and I'm I'm still waiting for for some questions in the chat. But as they are not coming in yet, I just continue with the conversation. And you you brought the next um, uh, keyword in there: the disagreement on China or the possible disagreement on China between uh, Europeans and the US. And I think there was already a little bit of. Um, um, a taste of this just before Christmas when when uh, Europe concluded the investment pact uh, um, together uh, with China and there were some critical voices coming out of Washington DC mainly from uh, the think tank uh, community there arguing that it would have been better to wait for uh, for the Biden administration coming in and tackle the China challenge uh, together maybe have a little, a little bit more leverage. I, I was was curious, uh, Tobias, how, how how you saw this uh, debate unfolding, and whether it it is actually an expression of strategic autonomy to not wait for the for for the U.S. and 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 go ahead, or would it have been maybe better to 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 join forces, so to say, and 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 try to reach a more comprehensive agreement uh, together with the U.S. Would that would that have been possible at all? Yeah, I mean, the great ambivalence of strategic autonomy, anyone can imp interpret it the way they want. And so we've seen arguments on both sides that this is the ultimate expression of strategic autonomy and others have argued that this is the ultimate defeat of strategic autonomy. Um, this agreement is yeah, pretty difficult. I think there's a lot to unpack. Um, uh, there's at least the, the strategic and the or geopolitical dimension, maybe. And then there's maybe really the content of the agreement. Um, I'm on the impression that on the on the on this argument that it would that it would um, be a poor signal for transatlantic cooperation, I would question that argument. Um, you know, the investment agreement I think fits into this multidimensional policy of the EU. The EU retains all its autonomous policies that I that I talked about earlier. It retains also its abilities to implement more, and this agreement doesn't stop uh, the US and the EU together from launching WTO cases like the EU would also like to do, um, uh, you know, bringing up the WTO again, going together through that organ uh, 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 and creating these rules, getting back in track into this trilateral format that the Americans, the Europeans and the Japanese have started, but it's also sluggish. Um, it doesn't uh, prohibit uh, the, the partners from coordinating the autonomous policies. There's also a lot of going on in the United States. You know, we have channels to coordinate and, you know, Last time I checked, I don't know what a Biden administration, what kind of China strategy they have. Um, there's a lot of stuff on the table still from the Trump administration in in these in this geoeconomic trade sector, uh, sector from you know, financial sanctions, from all sorts of tech controls and trade controls, from entity lists and so on and so on. We don't know what's going to be left on the table, what uh, what they will take off, what they will retain, and you know, all in all, I think you can ask, is not the EU a strategy? We kind of have a strategy. Okay, we can criticize it, but there is a strategy. Is that not also a good strategy? Do we have, to, does not the United States also um, can attach to that strategy and uh, the, the investment agreement may be part of the strategy? 
one argument. Um, second law, very briefly, of course, it's not only about that strategic uh, dimension. I think the content matters and we don't have the text yet of the agreement. We will get tomorrow. We're promised, even though it seems to be redacted, uh, retracted uh, content. And of course, there's a lot of questions. There's the whole economic issue on market access. Hmm, the people who had access uh, of, of leaked stuff, there's a lot of underwhelming reports so far on level playing field issues like tackling technology transfers. Um, um, it seems to be not major concessions. There's a whole issue, of course, of the sustainable issues that are very important in the European civil dialogue on, on labor, on climate and so on. They seem to be very poor. That's not unusual, you know, that there's that enforcement of these kind of lofty commitments is essentially not given. There is factually no enforcement. The EU has never had any of uh, strict enforcement on these. That's pretty normal, but I think um, I'm not sure whether the public uh, in Europe will carry that, that it's been so little concessions on how to actually enforce uh, specifically some of these sustainable issues that, that people in uh, Europe care much and also the European Parliament cares a lot about. And um, yeah, um, so to, to conclude, maybe, you know, I think on the I don't think the agreement is is inhibiting any sort of transatlantic cooperation, but on the content, it's it is, in fact, it looks to be very limited. And um, I wouldn't be surprised. There's going to be a lot, of, a long year of, of lobbying and arguing uh, here in Brussels because the European Parliament has the final vote on this and they have positioned themselves quite heavily as many of them as being opposed to this agreement. So um, it's not done yet for sure. It's going to be, I wouldn't be surprised if in one year time it might be struck down. And I think Americans who are opposed to this will also very heavily be active here in Brussels with the European Parliament. Thank you, Tobias. Yeah, certainly, certainly something to watch out for in the coming days when the text in its retracted version is, is, is coming, going to come out. Um, there will be probably further discussions around um, around US China policy going forward. Um, before I go to the questions that now started to tickle in, um, I wanted to ask Hannah first uh, what she thinks is, you know, we are the Finnish Institute of International Affairs here. So, so part of, of the idea is also to think about how, what, how, how do we see this? Like, is there a certain Finnish or let's say Nordic Baltic perspective on this issue? I mean, it's clear that uh, there's close military relationship with the United States. We also um, um, keen for um, uh, having, having an, an open market economy and, and free trade. Uh, that's more or less the orientation here from Finland and um, less about protectionism. But on the other hand, we also think uh, comprehensively about security and are concerned about the security issues. Uh, how, do, how do you see the Nordic perspective from looking from here? Yeah, uh, the, the small Nordic states, uh, by definition, multilateralists. And also, if we think of uh, Sweden and Finland, certainly very much in favor of a strong EU, but on a rather pragmatic way. And uh, I think here I would like to reconnect with what Alice was saying about um, sovereignty as a kind of a potentially mm, more neutral term that could be easier to accept than strategic autonomy. I think that for countries like Finland and Sweden, uh, sovereignty is even more difficult to accept. It's uh, on a conceptual basis. Uh, for, for them, strategic autonomy might work uh, but in a very pragmatic sense of being more capable, more in charge, uh, but not uh, acting alone. Uh, they are quite transatlantic um, when it comes to their uh, policy preferences. So um, I think overall what we now see, interestingly, is quite a lot of hedging, we could say, uh, for both Finland and Sweden. They are both investing much more on defense than before, um, partly to defend themselves, 
but also partly to qualify for all of these cooperative arrangements of different kinds, qualifying as partners. And uh, so I think in the end, the, the, the problem for them is how to navigate the, the, the um, multiple forms of cooperation that we now have. All the initiatives, be it bilateral, trilateral, multilateral, plurilateral, EU, European, transatlantic, trans-European. I think small states now will, will have um, quite a lot to do just to navigate this totality of options. Thank you, uh, Hannah. Uh, Alice uh, raised her hand, and that is that is actually a good coincidence because I plan to uh, address you in any case uh, because there has been one one question in 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 the chat room on uh, on cyber espionage, and that reminded me of of, of course that you are head of the uh, technology and geopolitics program there at your institute, so maybe this could be directed at you, and it's a question. Uh, about the possibility of reaching cyber autonomy, sovereignty in the future as the European Union. Uh, um, so yeah, is that technologically possible? Uh, a question mark. So technological is of course a difficult question, but yeah, how does it look about, uh, on 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 cyber and internet issues when when we when we think about strategic autonomy? Um, uh, the question we don't know who who sent it. But it's related also to cyber espionage and the Snowden revelations, and and maybe there's a need to have more autonomy when it comes to uh, internet communication, online communication, and of course there's a whole 5G discussion as well. So I just thought maybe I don't know if you want to address the, this question directly, but if you have any other views, given that you're working on this uh, geopolitics uh, of technology dimension um, when it comes to strategic autonomy. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's at the heart of the agenda for the transatlantic relationship in the coming years. It's uh, there is so much for the two sides of the Atlantic to discuss. Uh, much of it relates to China, which we've already mentioned. Much of it relates to indeed um, sovereignty of data uh, and the question of of, uh, of uh, privacy and the uh, and um, and the threat of, of espionage. I think um, on on many of those. Uh, uh, aspects. Um, it's also um, a matter. I mean, let me let me uh, uh, let me rephrase. So there there there's specific areas in which the two sides we're, we're going are going to have to work on. Uh, there is areas for cooperation. There is areas for debate and conflicts as well because. Um, the Europeans and uh, uh, and the US do not necessarily see eye to eye on on many of the aspects and the the the, um, the Snowden revelations from 2013 are a case in point because that's exactly when the Europeans started talking about digital sovereignty you know whatever that means and that's currently under under discussion um, so one point is indeed on this data privacy question and the data flows question that was uh, the theme that was already uh, raised by Tobias because it's also a trade um, question. Uh, I mean, the problems uh, to be tackled are indeed, for example, the, the Cloud Act that that the, the Trump administration put together and which allows uh, American um, authorities to, to legally access the uh, the data that is stored by U.S. companies outside of the U.S. territory, so including in, in European territory, data stored by any sort of big American companies in Europe can be accessed. Uh, so there are limitations to, to that, but it's, it's a big concern for Europe. Um, uh, typically, in terms of sort of ensuring the privacy of, of the data, the one of the projects under consideration, and that's about to be implement, implemented in a, in a in a format that still is you know being discussed and debated is is the european sovereign cloud to indeed store the data uh, encourage companies to store their industrial data in uh, safe clouds that are europe based and that respects the regulations uh, for privacy uh, that that uh, that europe has put in place so that's a way of uh, to, to also answer the earlier point about uh, about sovereignty um, by by anna i think uh, the data sovereignty that each individual is sovereign over the data or each company is sovereign over the data is one way uh, that it can be implemented uh, uh, in the uh, in the digital sphere. Uh, 
Obviously, digital is transnational. Uh, you can't nationalize it fully. Otherwise, it's what we call, you know, the splinternet, where every block starts to have their own internet uh, with the the control of the infrastructure of the of the software and of the information, which is not what we want. But there is going to be discussion as well about big tech companies regulation, uh, the question of uh, antitrust uh, laws enforcement, for example. Uh, and there is indeed the the, the question of uh, uh, that's sort of broader than the digital, but that relates to the strategic autonomy question, uh, which is, for example, uh, uh, U.S. extraterritorial uh, measures against China, against uh, Chinese uh, manufacturing companies like Huawei, but also um, uh, semiconductors uh, that that lead to a whole reorganization of the of the global value chains that that European companies have to deal with. And that's really something that needs to be uh, negotiated at the transatlantic level you can't just have the us that takes unilateral decisions that have such consequences on european economies on european companies so that's going to be as well on the table i think um uh the, the, one of the, the the aspects as well is going to be is this is this a us eu question or is this uh, a more multilateral question you know there are so many aspects to tackle to tackle in the digital space right now and more broadly the, the technological realm that uh you know it might be the case that some that that uh, that nato may be the right forum for, for some things the un may be the right forum for others uh, multilateral groupings may be the right forum for for for, for other issues um i think for the eu sake you know whether it's bilateral EU US or it's multilateral will be the, the most effective um, than compared to smaller groupings. Um, but yeah, sorry, I see we're already almost out of time and there's so much to cover. But but yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Well, that's really the heart of the matter right now. Thank you so much. Yeah, very, very important points. Uh, yeah, as you said, like we are now uh, unfortunately starting to get, get a little bit over time, but I still want to give, I see Garrett has his hand up. So uh, please. Uh, Yes, thank, thank you, uh, Nicholas. I wanted to address one of the comments that was made in the chat about, you know, this is nothing new. And yes, correct. Every president since Eisenhower, even before Kennedy, has berated Europeans to do more for defense and spend more. But, you know, it reminds me of the old sort of Soviet communist joke where the foreman would say, you know, to his employees, we'll, you know, we'll pretend to pay you and the workers would respond, we'll, prepare, we'll pretend to work. And for a long time, there was a bit of a ritualistic nature to the Americans saying to Europeans, come on, please do more on defense. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but, you know, I don't think there was really any credibility there. But I think what we're seeing now, and I think if you're cutting to the chase, the fundamental question we have is on the American side, you know, is there a, are they prepared to move away from the assumption, the unspoken assumption for many years, that Europeans left to their own devices will return to their sort of divisive and interfighting state. Okay. Because it, it's fair to say, OK, yes, you want Europeans to do more, but are you also prepared to divide the labor and to divide leadership more? And that's something I think an assumption, a fundamental assumption that the United States has to think about. On the European side, and I wish our, our colleague Nicole Koenig was here, in her chapter talks about, OK, strategic autonomy, but from whom? To do what? Uh, I, I can understand Europeans chafing at being feeling subordinate or jun the junior partner in this relationship with the United States. But if that changes, for what purpose? For me, those are the, the fundamental questions here in this debate. And unless they're really seriously addressed, I think we're going to return four years from now. We might have another, you know, workshop where we'll be discussing the same thing over and over again. Excellent. Thank you for, 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 for this point, Garrett. I think that uh, that is that is definitely a, a right. Uh, and um, so yeah, we are really approaching now the end of, of this uh, workshop. Uh, I see there's one question still that uh, we couldn't address. Maybe I, I can address it very briefly. It, it is the, about the strategic compass, which is currently discussed within the EU and whether this will clarify the concept of strategic autonomy. And from my conversations and the workshops that I took part uh, in in relation to the strategic upper compass, I would say uh, no, it will not look directly at the concept of strategic autonomy. It rather wants to focus on the policies and on the core capabilities and uh, how and, and it rather looks at it uh, from the 
it uses the concept capability to act as well. So uh, it's it's much more focused on um, making progress in the area of security and defense policy on on different issues like capabilities, like partnerships, like um, resilience, um, and uh, less focused on and, and it, it it wants to avoid actually this 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 broader debates that sometimes also sometimes help le help less than they do harm uh, when it comes to uh, especially defense policy. In any case, I think this was a very interesting discussion which showed actually the, the breadth of this whole theme of strategic autonomy and how it covers so many different policy areas and it is very different in each of those uh, the debate and, and, and the instruments and the answers that we are going to seek and also the, the 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 transatlantic uh, relationship um, um, uh, yeah is 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 quite complex looking forward um, uh, it's it's not going to be rosy under the Biden administration all of a sudden but there are still policy differences that we that we need need to tackle there still will be going to be questions about burden sharing there's still going to be questions about China um, so. Uh, these discussions will will stick with us in the future, and uh, I I can encourage you all then to look out for our report that we are currently writing, which is going to come out uh, probably in the yeah, beginning of April, and um, then we can discuss these issues further. And we have also some material to present, so that's going to be very exciting. Thank you so much, Garrett. Thank you so much, Tobias, Alice, Hannah, for, for taking part in this panel conversation. Now we have five minutes over two, uh, so I better release everyone now from, from their screen. And, and here in, uh, in, in Finland, I wish them a good evening. And in, uh, in the US, uh, have, a, have a great day ahead of you. And uh, yeah, I hereby close this seminar. Thank you so much.